Mental health has been close to my heart since I turned 21. I had issues. Some I brought on myself. Others arose from the actions of others. Still, they were my issues. Nevertheless, I kissed them goodbye. Then I suffered existentially and came to realize that I must dedicate myself to getting better at doing something, anything. Hopefully, something I enjoyed. I needed to establish, define, and cultivate a life for myself. Then, surely opportunities would manifest themselves, blossoming from beneath the soil where potential lay. I, now, am ready to embrace the opportunities because I am ready to take responsibility for my life. Now, as an adult, my tool belt full of hammers, nails, and measuring tapes, I am ready to build my house and construct an identity I am proud of. This book is a culmination of ideas I believe might just set the foundation to which I and others may construct an ego, an identity, predicated on humility, integrity, insight, and learning. I hope that, permeating through this ego, humility and curiosity resonate above all else. I was lost for so long. I didn't know how to live, not the least to live with intent. For that reason, and to bypass potential diagnoses like OCD, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and depression, I want to give people the tools necessary to build a purposeful life. There isn't only one way to live, but there are specific ways, skills, and methods human beings use and have used since we came into consciousness to cultivate meaningful lives. Life is impermanent. Our purposes, our actions undertaken to produce desired end goals, change all the time. If we each possess the necessary tools to imbue intrinsic meaning within our lives, we won't wander aimlessly or at least will remain when we have, excuse me, or at least will realize when we've begun to. That way we can catch our existential anguish before it overwhelms us and produces a depression, a personal grievance of sorts. If we all knew how to frame and reframe our lives, if we knew how to instill meaning from a practical standpoint within them, our sense of identity, self-worth, confidence across time, and acceptance of others given the acceptance of ourselves, will ameliorate the vast devastation individual and collective nihilism leaves in its wake. My previous and first book, Yes I'm Fine, Just Tired, gave a look into the mind of a human being on high alert. I must confess it feels weird describing myself, although it was in the past, as someone who had an anxiety disorder. That man is nothing but a distant memory, an old identity. My anxiety now functions well. Ah, anxiety, with all its twists and turns. Anxiety with retrospect gave me a life worth living because it forced me to look inward, perceiving all the shit and gunk I'd neglected for so long. The Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung called this the shadow. Unfortunately, quote, when we never leave that state of chronic emergency, that me-first mentality that pervades, All our thinking strengthens and endures, leading us to become self-indulgent, self-serving, and self-important. It is important to recognize, just as it was and still is for me, how our thinking makes us feel and act. Anxiety is a selfish, by definition, emotion. That doesn't mean it's immoral, bad, or wrong. Just note how it might dictate your thinking for future reference. Writing is my meditation, my creative venture, my everything. As a kid, I watched my father write and was inspired beyond belief. I'd never seen anyone work so hard in complete silence. I too fell in love with it, probably because it gave me an outlet to express when talking to others seemed too overwhelming. It would not matter if I were incarcerated so long as I had a pen and paper, an escape. Writing helped me befriend the voice in my head. Better yet, writing helped me connect with my youth the boy I left behind once external forces proved too influential. Writing was a portal back to the past, back to a time when I could be whatever and whoever I wanted to be. A footballer, astronaut, lion, a man. I could not be a bigger advocate for writing. It helps me express my thoughts, assess my blind spots and make sense of things. It is a creative art of expression and opinion as much as it is a way to help cultivate a greater sense of self. Writing the truth, as one currently perceives, being honest, is highly beneficial for a myriad of reasons, some of which are explored in this book. I know writing, or storytelling, 
helps others too, and has done across the centuries since the dawn of consciousness. Writing your thoughts down, hand thinking, is a great way to understand yourself, to make sense of yourself. To love yourself, you must firstly begin by attempting to understand yourself. Writing your thoughts down offers a different perspective. It's a tool. It's a ladder to help you see over the backyard fence. You are not your thoughts. You are the observer of your thoughts. Writing them down allows you to observe them. Therefore, observe yourself, the one behind the thoughts. We forget we are the observers and not the thoughts themselves. I fell in love with writing because it helped me. After a panic attack one night, my mum advised me to write about it, so I did. Almost instantly, I felt as though the panic attack was being sucked through the pen, out from my body and onto the page. The thoughts were no longer causing riot in my head. Rather, they formed coherent, structured sentences on the page. That night, I was reminded of my love of writing, because I've always been a writer. I've always tried to make sense of things with a pen or a keyboard. When I was 10, I wrote a 10,000 word essay about a young man named Peter who struggled with depression. His parents died in a house fire when he was young. He was bullied at school, suffered from PTSD, and struggled to find meaning in life. Hi, my name is Peter, I wrote. Peter Reynolds, to be exact. I explained to the reader that Peter had depression. Did I know what that word even meant? I know that the ideas expressed in that pessimistic yet hearty book reappear in this one. I know I've always struggled to find meaning in life, but that's because I never received the how-to memo. So I decided to write the memo myself, albeit a much more complete, in-depth analysis. Peter was my first attempt. Behind the curtain is my second and final one. We as human beings need to feel, to love and be honest. We need to recognise that the complete human experience is the meaning of life, warts and all. The words on these pages, therefore, are an attempt for me and for all of us to come to terms with everything that holds us back from being ourselves. Most importantly, behind the curtain is an exploration of identity, an exploration towards inner peace. We embody and personify the stories we tell ourselves. These stories, comprised of experience, social norms, value hierarchies and belief systems, structure our perceptions. They structure our lives. In order to change, we need to change the story. We need to understand the story, perceive it objectively, and make adjustments when necessary. If our story isn't serving us, if we are depressed, anxious, lost or stuck, the malleable narrative we live by needs to change. So begs the question, why change? How do we know if we're depressed, anxious, lost, or stuck? Could our lives be any better than they are? What else is out there and within here? In early 2019, I interviewed David G, a meditation teacher originally from New York, who explained to me that, quote, when your cup is full, all you can do is give back. Self-love is attainable, but it starts with a step. More importantly, it begins with a selfish act of kindness. We need to fill our own cups first before we can give back, before we can help others. If you're questioning your narrative, if you think there's more to life and to you, start with yourself. You can set an example. People will follow you. The value that sits at the top of my personally constructed hierarchy is the fulfillment of potential. After some time questioning, reading, writing, reflecting, I have found no greater feeling other than attempting to be better every day. Like Sisyphus, the mythological Greek king, pushing that heavy boulder up a hill, life commands us to strive, to be better. We must accept that life is a striving, not an attaining, at least not entirely. The irony of life is that it is the process, the journey that fulfills us most, not the destination. This book is an uncovering of identity, a journey to the journey, a cultivation of conscious awareness. <laughs>